I still can't decide whether to say Merry Christmas or Happy New Year. So I'm going to say both Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, St. Mark. There you, you can't decide either. <laughs> Good morning. I'm so glad you're here this morning. We're going to try to do an intersection of both this morning, of Christmas and New Year's this morning, and you're going to see that flowing through our service today. I want to invite you into God's joy. Uh, we have a clean slate and the forgiveness of sins of the new year, and our past is forgiven. Let's enter into that joy here by singing our first hymn, God Rest Ye, You Merry Gentlemen. Please join us if you feel comfortable. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful, Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you 
and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let's join in this hymn, praising God for sending Jesus. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the martyred innocents of Bethlehem show forth your praise, not by speaking, but by dying. Put to death in us all that is in conflict with your will, that our lives may bear witness to the faith we profess with our lips. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today comes from Isaiah chapter 63. Here the Lord works out his salvation, and we remember that at Christmas. The prophet says, I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their savior. 
In all their distress, he too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. This is God's word. I want to invite you this Christmas to uh, please stand out of respect for the words and works of Jesus. This is the last time we're going to do this. Until we hit Advent, I'm going to come and read of the life and work of Jesus right in your midst as a symbol here in the season of Christmas that Christ came and lived among us to save us. This reading from Matthew reminds us that there is a cosmic collision when the Christ comes into the world. And not only is there acceptance, but there is also great hostility. This is the gospel from Matthew chapter 2. When they had gone... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared and dreamed to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This time you're invited to join in singing our hymn of the day.
Our scripture that we're looking at here this morning comes from Titus chapter 2. And this is uh, Paul's take on Christmas. This is what he writes. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is God's word. This is an interesting preaching day, I think, because what you have here is the intersection of Christmas and New Year's. Now, I know that some of you, at least emotionally, are done with Christmas. <laughs> You're done. You might even take in down your trees, which is why the Mankato Free Press was telling you where you could put them and throw them away. So you're done with Christmas. But historically, historically, Christmas has never been a day. I'm going to rant about that for a second. I heard a, a talk by a pastor who's prominent in our circles who was going on and on in an ethically charged manner about how Christians should stop believing that Christmas Day is the day that Jesus was born. <laughs> Christians have never insisted on that, though. December 25th is not the day that we think this is the day we know by historical fact that Jesus was born. Christmas, Christians are not historical nincompoops. <laughs> We are not the God. We nailed it down. It's December. We know for We don't know that. We don't stand up in the, I'm ranting, can you tell? We don't stand up in the creed and say that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th. We don't say that. In fact, we have always said historically that Christmas is not a day. It is a season of re sustained reflection, which is why we have songs like the 12 Days of Christmas, because we haven't ever thought it's a day. We're not historical nincompoops. It's a season. And it's important that we clarify what it is, because I think what often happens in our lives is we confuse what Christmas has for what Christmas is. Like sometimes people think that Christmas is giving like the world says that the Christmas Christmas is giving I saw somebody somebody talking about that and it cracked me up because this person said that it's better quoted Jesus it's better to give than to receive and by the way here's my address and it started it's funny but this person see sometimes in the culture what happens is we confuse what Christmas has we, we give gifts with what it is I saw a pastor's wife make the same, same confusion, same mistake, in a different way. She said, she said this, is, this is Christmas. Christmas is family. No, 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 it has family. That's not what it is. It's, it's one of the, it's the accoutrement, it's the side dish. It's not what it is. Or sometimes we get this wrong spiritually, like it's our, some, sometimes even a, a spiritual leader, a clergyman will say, this is what Christmas is. Christmas, I've heard to talk like this, Christmas is about fear. It's about dealing with your fears. No, it's not. It's something deeper. Now, it was, it was an interesting talk. Everybody at the first Christmas, right? Everybody at the first Christmas was fearful. They were afraid. Very true. But why? Go deeper. This isn't just psychological. This isn't just a spiritual malady. Why were they afraid? Why? Because of what Christmas is. Christmas is the cosmic collision between God and man between heaven and earth. What is Christmas? Let me define it this way. 
Do you know why we started it? Do you know why we started Christmas? We started Christmas. Now it got way big. It turned into this snowball. It kept turning, 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 and now it's, there's all kinds of Christmas traditions that are attached. But why did we start it? Do you know why we started it? It's embarrassing, actually. We started Christmas because Christians didn't know who Christ was. It's embarrassing. It's awkward. But that's why we started. We started because if you ask an average Christian, a lot of them would likely say Jesus was a created being. They even had slogans. They had, these, they had these slogans. They said there was a time when Jesus was not. He's a created being. And it was embarrassing for us. But the reason why we started Christmas is because Christians didn't know who Jesus was. And so what we said is we got to have, we have got to have a sustained time of reflection to understand who Jesus is. This Jesus is the incarnation of God. See, and you have, look, you have that right here in Titus. Paul comes out, you have that right here. This is Christmas. What does Paul say? This is the doctrine of the incarnation. God, see, the grace of God, Paul says, has appeared. It's something that you can see. It's something that you can touch. It's, it's, a, it's a theophany, we would say, if you want to use theological terms. Jesus has come in the flesh, and so that's the first, right, right on his heels, he's, he's the doctrine of the incarnation again. Paul says, not only has the grace of God appeared, you can see him, you can touch him, God in the flesh. He says, he, he goes on to say this, he says that he is the appearing, listen to this language, he's the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you have to think this, you have to do a little bit of analysis there. What is Paul doing? Paul is attributing, think about this, Paul is attributing to Jesus the titles, the attributes, and the activities of God. Who is Jesus? He's God, Paul says. Who is Jesus? Paul says he is the great God. See, he has the attributes, the greatness of God. Who is Jesus? His coming is going to be glorious, Paul says. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Jesus is God. This is the doctrine of the incarnation here from Paul. In Christ is incarnate God. Nothing that is, nothing, nothing that not that nothing that is God is outside of Christ, or as we say in the hymn, knows this. Veiled in Christ, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. I want to try to help this sink in. Maybe I can do it like this. Do you know the story of Saint Nick? Like the true story of Saint Nick? I love telling this story. Do you know what he did? St. Nick, the legend about him, there's two, I'm going to tell you, you know, them in order. The first legend about him is this. There was a man that he found out about. He was a man who had three daughters, and they were running out of money. And word got around town that these, this man was going to have to give his daughters to prostitution to be able to live. And so what St. Nick did is he took gold coins and he dropped them down the chimney. Because he didn't want those girls to have to go into prostitution. It, bring, it brings some meaning to this m myth that we still have today that St. Nick, he comes down the chimney and there's cookies. But it's different, right? He drops gold coins so that girls don't have to go into prostitution. That's St. Nick. But do you know why he did it? Do you, know, do you know what drove this man who cared for the poor? Do you know what did it? See, St. Nick was involved in what's called the Arian controversy. See, there were people who were saying, there was a time when Jesus was not, he's only a created creature. And do you know what St. Nick did about that? Do you know what he did? Do you know what the legend has? He decked somebody. It made him so mad. See, there were people who were saying, Jesus isn't really God. He's not God from all eternity. And so what did St. Nick do? He decked somebody, which I think this time of year should bring a whole new meaning to decking the halls. <laughs> now, I'm not saying he should have done that. He shouldn't have done that. 
You know, it's just an aside, it's, it's an amazing thing, isn't it, that we can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Like we can give Christmas gifts this time of year and we can do it so that we don't look stupid or we don't look, or we look selfish. We can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. But St. Nick shows you that also you can do the wrong thing for the right reason. You can actually do terrible things because you love Jesus. So he decked somebody. But it also shows you this, and this is the whole point. St. Nick cared about the doctrine of the incarnation. That's what drove him. The church across the centuries, this, I, I decided this part in my sermon, it's either going to be the worst part because you're going to tune out, or you're actually going to listen to it and it's going to be the best part. I actually read a whole book of Christmas sermons because I want to give you the witness of the church. Here's the church across the centuries. This is what Jerome said. Jerome said, the mighty God who thundered in heaven now cries on earth. Leo the Great said that Christ took up our lowliness without diminishing his majesty. Guerrick of Igni said that Christ contracted himself from the incomprehensible immensity to the narrowness of the womb. And that he that, blow your mind, he that he contains the whole world suffered himself to be contained to a manger. Bernard of Clairvaux said that, the, that his was a birth above nature for the benefit of nature, surpassing nature by the excellence of his great miracle, but restoring nature by the power of its mystery. Thomas Akempis said that Christ permitted himself, just listen to this language, it's so beautiful. Christ permitted himself to be delivered to deliver all people. Augustine said that flesh was taken on by God without his being changed into flesh, that he took to himself what he was not while remaining what he was, that he came to us as a man without departing from the Father, that he continued to be what he is while appearing to us as what we are. And that, listen to this, that his divine power was confined in the body of the infant without being withdrawn from the whole mass of the universe. That's Christmas. Wow. That is Christmas. But now I gotta do New Year's too. (laughs) And so what I wanna do with the rest of our time is I wanna bring this teaching of Christmas to bear on time. And I wanna show you here with Paul's teaching the miracle of Christmas past, the miracle of Christmas present, and then finally the Christmas, the, the miracle of Christmas future. So here from Paul is the miracle of Christmas past. Oh, I'm so glad you came today. I always always think that the first Sunday after Christmas, it's the hearty people. It's the hearty people who come. Same thing the first Sunday after Easter. It's the hearty. I'm so glad you came, though, because you get to hear the news. Do you realize how saved you are? Did you, did you, let me, let me try to underline this. Did you, did you notice what Paul called Jesus? What did he call him? He didn't call him Jesus. Did you notice what he called him? He called him the grace of God. I mean, do you get that? Let me, let me follow another preacher here and, and point this out. Do you realize what he's not called? Jesus is not called here the strict righteousness of God. He's not called that. He's not, he's, he didn't show up in our lives to, to, to make you toe the line or to, or to tune you up from last year or to become some kind of disciplinarian because of 2022. Oh no, he's not called the strict righteousness of God. You know what else he's not called? He's not called the eternal love of God and that's a good thing. It's actually good. If you think, it's, if you think that's, if that sounds strange to you, that shocks you, that I'm telling you it's good news that Jesus is not called the, the love of God, then you haven't thought about it enough. See, because sometimes you don't want love. Like, some, when, when, like when I was a kid, and I did stuff that was wrong, and my parents disciplined me, I didn't want their love. 
Sometimes you don't want God's love. Just think about it. Do you really want God's love for what you did back in 2022? Do you really want that? Do you want him to, do you want him to enter in your life as a disciplinarian? I don't want that. I, I want something way more than God's love. I want God's grace. <laughs> I want him to forgive me. I want him to let it go. You don't always want God's love. What you want is God's grace. Jesus is the grace of God. Do you realize how saved you are? Did we, did we do it? Did we take Christmas and New Year's? Did we put it together? Do you, see, do you see it? Jesus is the grace of God that has appeared, that is salvation for all people. That's what Paul says, for all people, no matter what in 22, no matter how much you prayed or how much you didn't, no matter how pious you were, how pious you weren't, no matter how much you, you, you paid attention to God or you didn't, this is for you. The grace of God. That is something more than just the plain love of God giving you his love for free. Because as a man, he takes your place. And as God, he makes the payment you can't. The grace of God has appeared for all people, which means your Christmas miracle is that your past is truly past. How's that for some good news today? But that brings us up to the present because it's another miracle and this is the one that Paul actually dwells on. Did you notice it? So the incarnation teaches you to say no to the wrong things and, and yes to the right things, which is very, very helpful on New Year's Day because what are we always tempted to do? <laughs> Why do you eat too much? <laughs> you're, saying, you're saying yes to the wrong things. Why do you spend too much money? You're saying yes to the, see, what, we get this all, we get this all backwards. We say, we say yes to the wrong things and we say, we say no to the right things and we get it backwards. And what Paul says is, is that the incarnation teaches you, it educates you, it empowers you. See, this is God's miracle in the presence. This is right here, right now, that you begin to more and more and more to say yes to the right things and, and no to the wrong things. It's power for Christian living. Great, great power. Paul says it's comprehensive, actually. You'll notice that he says what, what ends up happening is you say no to ungodliness, which is talking about your relationship to God. That's why you use the word God. And you say no to worldly passions, to worldliness. And by the way, that doesn't mean that you reject the world or the creation or something like that. Worldliness means that you actually act like the world, that you are in the world only for yourself, only to take for yourself. Paul says that gets reversed. And every relationship in your life gets changed by the incarnation. You say yes to being godly. And which is your relationship with God. And you say yes to uprightness, which is doing the right thing for everybody else. And you say yes to self-control, which is having a right relationship with your life and with yourself. So every relationship in your life gets changed by the incarnation. Your relationship with God through godliness, your relationship with yourself through self-control, and your relationship to the world through un un uprightness, it all gets changed. And of course it does. How can we ever lack a consciousness of God when he's shown up here? You can't. You, just, you can't. As, as, one, as one ancient preacher put it, in a certain sense, Jesus doesn't even need to be preached because he came here. We saw him. We touched him. He came here. How can we ever lack a consciousness of God? 
And why, why would we ever enter the world? Why would we ever enter the creation for ourselves? Why would we do it only to seek for ourselves when we realize deeply that we have been sought? See, it changes our relationship with, with other people and it changes our relationship with, with ourselves. Why would we ever treat ourselves like garbage? Right? Why? We have been loved by the Son of God. Why would we ever treat? We're not garbage. We have been bought. We have been won. See, the incarnation is the power to change. It's the power to change. Now, I figure there's two groups of people here. Some of us are mules. Some of us, I'm so sinful I can't change. I got, I got too much sin. Can't or won't? You're being a mule. You can change. Some of us need to repent. Others of us need to be encouraged. You can change. You you realize what we're talking about here, what the hymn says, and I think it was Hark the Herald that says, why was Christ born? To give you second birth. You can change. Jesus lives inside of you. And do you realize he's no pansy? He's not weaker than your sin. (laughs) Change might be hard. It might come over a long period of time, but you can change. You can change. You can actually change. You You can say no to the wrong stuff. You can say yes to the right stuff. The incarnation teaches you. It's present power, Paul says. It's very, very, very good news on New Year's Day. You can change. But then Paul gives you one last little gift here. He gives you the miracle of Christmas future. This is what he says. He says that our great God, Christ, is coming again. He calls this a blessed hope. Of course it's a blessed hope because as Jesus himself told us, he comes to make all things new. And in the meantime, he says, what we get to do in the meantime, as we wait for him to come and make all things new, in the meantime, Christ has redeemed us to do good things. Now, I thought about this a lot. Um, I've decided that this year for me, and by extension to you, because I'm your pastor, this is the year of joy. (laughs) I also woke up this morning, and then as I'm claiming Jesus' joy, I actually had a little bit of anxiety about that because I know that 2023 brings a lot of uncertainties with it, and so it's not going to be an easy thing, like snap snap your fingers or it's all going to be joyful. It doesn't work that way. We're going to have to work at it. That's why we need this gift. The gift here is perseverance. I thought about that a lot this week, that what Paul gives you here is the gift of perseverance. You know what you need for perseverance? You actually need two things, not one. You need two. First, you need purpose. You need purpose. Victor Franco uh, very famously, he survived multiple concentration camps. He wrote about his, his, his experience of it. And he, what he noticed in the concentration camps is that it wasn't the people who were most physically gifted who actually remained alive. He said it was the people who had purpose. What Viktor Frankl ended up saying is that the person who has their why can survive Anyhow, you need purpose. What's going to keep going, keep you going when you're in pain? You know why you're here. And Paul just told you why you're here. Why are you here? See, this isn't talking about heaven. When, when, when Paul says you have been redeemed, see, you have been redeemed. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about right here. 
Why are you here in 2023? Why did you make it? Because God has purposes for you. He has, he has redeemed you for himself. He has purified for himself a people so that you can go out in your lives and you can do good. You have purpose. See, God made you on purpose. He redeemed you on purpose to do good things in life. You have purpose. That's the first ingredient you need for perseverance. But here's the second one. You need a finish line. You know, I was reflecting on this too. Nobody starts races without a finish line. You don't do it. Now, you might run a marathon. You might. But you won't ever start a race without a finish line. You have a finish line. The blessed hope of Christ reappearing, Paul says. It's a blessed hope. See, it's a blessed hope. Look, there's other kinds of hopes too. If I could compare and contrast for a second, Lauren Elaine has a song. It's called Getting Good. I want to quote a little bit of it to you. Lauren Elaine says, Once I fall in love, then I'll be happy. And then she says that she falls in love and there's still a hole. And she says, Once I get some money, then it'll be easy. And then she talks about how she always still feels broke. And then she hopes for a call that doesn't a car that doesn't stall, and then she worries about chipping the new one. She hopes that she'll stop worrying once she gets older, and then she still does, and then she hopes for a bigger house, and then she just wants a bigger one. Don't you know? This is how it is. There are cursed hopes. You hope to get married, and then your marriage isn't it. You hope to have a kid, and then the kid isn't it. You hope to have more money, and then the money isn't it. And these cursed hopes. But this is a blessed one. Because when Christ comes back, he makes all things new. So you have a finish line. And when you have a finish line, you can keep going. And those are the two ingredients to perseverance. You know what you're doing matters. And you know that there's a point where you don't have to do it anymore. And it is the blessed gift in your future of perseverance. So there's my sermon. I tried. (laughs) I really tried. The intersection of Christmas and New Year's. And what I was trying to say is this. It's Christ for you forever. It's Christ in you with so much power. It's Christ before you, before you even get there. And for that matter, he's next to you and behind you and every other place in your life too. So St. Mark, Merry Christmas or Happy New Year's or hopefully both today. The incarnation of our Lord is yours. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to be one of us. You have a birth, not of a woman, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also a birth, not of a man, born of a Virgin Mary, true God and true man, the perfect person to be the man in our place and the God who does it perfectly to redeem our lives to empower our present, and to give us perseverance in the future. Bless us with this. In your name, amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith using uh, selected portions of the Athanasian Creed this morning. It is furthermore necessary for eternal salvation that one faithfully believe that our Lord Jesus Christ also took on human flesh. Now this is the true Christian faith. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He is God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and he is man, born in time from the nature of his mother. Holy God, a holy man, with rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father and Less than the Father as to his humanity. 
And though he is both God and man, Christ is not two persons, but one. One, not by changing the deity to, into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. One indeed, not by mixture of the natures, but by unity in one person. For just as the rational soul and flesh is one human being, so God and man is one Christ. He suffered for our salvation. He ascended into hell, rose the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there we will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise with their own bodies to answer for their personal deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, but those who have done evil will go into eternal fire. This is the true Christian faith. Whoever does not faithfully and firmly believe this cannot be saved. Please be seated. Uh, at this time, uh, the offering plates will come around, um, and you're also welcome to sign uh, our worship registers. Um, and if you want uh, me to reach out to you uh, by phone, um, uh, put your phone number down in there and I will be happy to reach out to you. We stand for prayer. We do have um, a number of special prayers this morning. A lot going on in our church family. The mother of Deb Wells um, is currently in ICU, and we're going to be praying for her this morning. Also, we're going to pray for Rosie Tischer. Um, I just heard this morning that she's heading home from the hospital, hopefully this afternoon, but she's had a couple of hospital stays here, and um, we're thankful that she's regaining her strength. We're going to pray for Phyllis Olfer, who's um, going to be having a biopsy this Tuesday, and we pray for that and the results of that. Um, and then also, um, we're, we're praying for the family of Marvin um, Allen, a uh, long time, long, long time member here at St. Mark. Um, he went home to be with the Lord this past Friday. And the family um, is still making funeral arrangements. Um, it, it looks like, I hope I'm getting this right, that it looks like the, the funeral is going to be here this spring. This spring, but stay tuned for those funeral arrangements um, for Marvin. So we're going to keep all those prayers close to our hearts right now. Let's pray. Lord God, eternal Father and giver of every good gift, we commit to your mercy and forgiveness the year now ended. Forgive us our sins where we have done wrong. Work in our hearts true repentance and faith and redeem us from all the evils and hurts of the past year. You have shown us hard times and exposed many idols among us. 
Yet if we are faithless, Christ remains faithful and will not deny himself. Help our unbelief that we, knowing nothing, can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks to you for the many mercies and gifts you have showered upon us in this past year. You've given life, healed, and comforted. You provided for our spiritual and physical well-being. You are the Lord of life and take care of us every day. All this you have done, not because of any merit in us, but only out of your love for us in Jesus our Savior. Comfort and sustain all your children who suffer from any sickness, need, or affliction. Lord, in your mercy, you have preserved this congregation in the faith for another year. We give you thanks for your blessing and guidance. Grant that by your grace, we may continue to serve you in this place. Preserve the preaching and teaching in this place so that it is faithful to your word. Ensure that your holy sacraments are administered according to your commands and promises and help us to reach out in love to this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers prayers for our nation and its government. Preserve our republic, we implore you. Give health and competence to those who serve in positions of authority. Protect those who serve in the line of danger for our safety and give peace in our time. Lord, in your mercy, we commend your blessing and love the times yet to come. Until you bring this life on earth to an end, guard and guide us by your strong arm. Lead us according to your word and renew in us clean hearts that trust you and show love toward our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. In this new year, abide among us with your Holy Spirit, that we may always trust in the saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, we do call on you for the mother of Deb Wills, who is in the ICU. We do this trusting that you love us and our bodies. We are grieving this difficult time and ask that you bring comfort and healing. Lord, we also pray for Rosie Tischer and Phyllis Olfert, uh, who are ill. Give them perseverance and strength, and we especially pray at this time for their good spirits. Keep them encouraged, whatever battles they face, and give them their full strength back very soon. Lord, we also hold up to you at this time the family of Marvin Allen. We thank you for his faithful life, for the love that you placed in his soul for you and for others, and we ask that you encourage the family with the promises of the resurrection and the life at this time. Be with them, Father, as they mourn his loss. We all pray, we pray this in Jesus' name, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Here's a blessing for your new year. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Please be seated, and we will join in our closing hymn.
Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be starting right back up into our normal Bible study, um, Sunday school time. Um, but we're done this morning except just sharing the joy of Christmas with each other um, here on the way out the door as long as you want to hang out. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, and if you are a guest here with us, um, thank you for being here and join us again soon. Thank you.